I think we got to get this whole thing straightened out here, guys, and that I think there's a lot of people that want to create a garden, and they say they want to create a garden, and they just don't. And it seems maybe a bit daunting, um, as every new thing is, every new venture or hobby that you guys get into, I get into, it seems very daunting at first. You want to learn the piano, there's a big hump that you have to get over of knowing where all the keys are, getting the the technical aspect of it, knowing maybe some sheet music, you know. Um, there's just some things that you need to know before you go into this. Um, and if you know them, it makes the whole experience so much easier. And then, you know, let's say you learned how to bake. Uh, take that as an example. Once you've learned how to bake, you realize how stupidly easy it is. And you think back about the time that it took you, the time that you wasted, the time that you, I don't know, I guess uh, thought everything was daunting and had maybe a little bit of anxiety about what is it that you wanted to do. And then you just laugh about it because you realize how easy it really is. And you try to tell people when you teach them these things, how easy it is. Um, and they don't necessarily believe you. <laughs> but I know for a fact, you know, I've, I've got a decent amount of hobbies, guys. For those of you who don't know, you know, I've learned a number of different skills over the years, cooking and painting, um, singing, um, playing different sports, um, gardening, obviously, you know, everything in a way is sort of very interrelated and the, each thing that you learn, it makes learning the next thing a lot easier because everything's somehow sort of related, right? You also sort of get to understand how this all works, learning something. Um, you understand the process, right? So learning another thing, another skill is just that much easier. Um, you understand that there's going to be this phase where you're going to feel overwhelmed. You're going to basically just need to get yourself into it. So that's what I want to kind of talk about in today's episode of Fruit Talk is giving you guys, I guess, some tips and tricks and things that can make this a bit seemingly a lot easier because it is a joke. Growing food is a joke. Anyone can do this. Anyone can grow some fruit trees. Um it really is quite basic and if you understand the foundations as I mentioned of anything that you're trying to learn it's just gonna make it seem so so easy so we're also gonna talk about in this episode of fruit talk the garden um, how the summer garden is doing because we're harvesting a lot of stuff um, a lot of food there's just a ton of food right now and um, yeah, so let me do the intro real quick. This is Ross Raddy, and, and welcome back, guys, to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast-style video that I like to do for you guys every Wednesday night, 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, um, how to grow it, and um, also more of the weird and interesting fruits and vegetables that you guys may not have heard of. Um so yeah, that's what we're going to talk about in today's video. In this this episode of Fruit Talk is trying to get you guys in the mindset of starting a garden. We talked about in a prior episode, I think it was two episodes ago, about starting my fall garden. Quick update, everything has been planted uh, directly from seed. Um, so there's different ways, for those of you guys who don't know, you can either put seeds directly in the ground like you would imagine how it works or you can start them indoors or start them in a different environment um, and then transplant those little small pots or cells out into the garden beds um, and both of them have their nice advantages or disadvantages and some may be easier or more difficult for certain people depending on your setup your environment the time of the year uh, how skilled you are etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know, it can just get uh, a little bit challenging uh, for certain people. Um, so I 
think it's really easy just to throw them in the ground, at least for me. So I, I direct seeded a lot of these into the ground and we, we planted things like fennel and endive, all kinds of brassicas. We're doing uh, arugula now. Uh, we did some carrots, some beets, did quite a bit of beets actually. Um, I finally got around to making myself, we're going to talk about some of these crops that I've been harvesting as well because teaching you guys how to make a garden really doesn't take very long. Um, it's really quite simple. But we're going to talk about you know some of the things we're harvesting like the beets. We got to, to harvest some beets and actually juice them. I, I even got to cook some. Um, never really had a homegrown beet um, from my own yard. So it was interesting, at least in my mind, I wanted to grow a lot of beets to be able to juice them. And the juice is actually not bad. It's pretty good. Um, beet juice, believe it or not, I'm, I'm a fan. And um, the more beets we get, because uh, it is so healthy for you, I believe, um, it does definitely increase your blood flow, your circulation. You know, it's a vasodilator. So it's nice for exercising and um, and different, you know, strenuous activities. So for me, I think beet juice is a nice thing to have, and that's sort of why I'm, I'm growing it. But I was surprised to see when I juiced it, it really didn't taste all that bad. Didn't have to add anything. Quite earthy, uh, sweet. It was like eating sweet dirt, <laughs> as I like to put it. Um, so for me, a uh, big fan of the, the beets. We also planted, what else did we plant? Some fennel. Uh, we did uh, more of the broccoli. Um, man, even slightly before the fall garden, we planted some summer crops, believe it or not. So, you know, later summer crops like the cucumbers are coming in and we planted them really quite late. Uh, but they're, they're coming in just fine. Um, we even did a little bit of soybeans because my soybeans never came up for whatever reason. I mean, this is just something that can happen. You know, you may have one particular crop that doesn't come up or doesn't germinate well or something's eating it, which I think was the case in my case. And uh, so I got my soybeans going finally. Um, all the crops basically that we mentioned in uh, the video two weeks ago of Fruit Talk, we've, we've planted those out. And I, I the soil's actually been rather moist, although it's it's pretty dry here. I went down deep enough to get them into some moist soil, these seeds. And uh, I also additionally, uh, sometime last week, came in here and watered the uh, the beds because it has been very dry. We did get two inches of rain. So I planted the seeds right before the two inches of rain, which was fantastic. Then I came in here about a week, week and a half later and watered them in. And therefore, they're just they're off to the races at this point you know um it's it's almost like i can't fail uh it may rain in the next couple days pretty lightly but that's going to be nice because it is like 95 it's been consistently very warm here if we're able to have a little bit cooler temperatures and get a little bit more rain these seedlings will have no trouble getting through july um, and then growing through August. Once we get into like mid-August, we're starting to look pretty decent on these younger, smaller seedlings that may have potential to bolt. Um, so it's it's a bit tricky. It's extremely tricky doing it at this time of the year, especially direct seeding certain crops. Um, so if I can just keep things a bit cooler, you know, I have uh, some shade cloth. I have the insect netting, which is, I guess, a form of the shade cloth. They're in a, a shadier spot. They're not in the warmest spot of the yard. So, you know, all these different things, watering, doing all this has really set the, uh, the fall garden up really nicely. I have some, um, because the spring garden really wasn't a good success. The summer garden has been an immense success. I imagine the fall garden is going to be an immense success. The spring garden didn't work out this year for various different reasons. I mean, it, it's not like I had nothing. I had plenty of things to eat, um, and they're still coming in, like the carrots, the beets, the radishes were good, the turnips were good, the arugula was amazing, the peas were amazing. But there were certain things like the brassicas that are just very difficult to grow. The onions were a complete and utter failure. Um, but, you know, if I could have a successful brassica crop, that to me is a successful 
season of uh, of vegetables because they're just so difficult. They really are. We have a shorter window for them to grow in that in those cooler temperatures. Then the summer solstice comes, and then it becomes very difficult at that point. But I actually believe it or not, I had some Brussels sprouts, some broccoli I planted very early in the spring. And they didn't do all that much all spring. They didn't transplant well. They didn't like life for the most part. Um, and then they got through the summer solstice. They've gotten through this July period here. Most of them haven't bolted, haven't seemed to be affected by it, which is quite strange. Um, and therefore, I'm going to be able to get a number of different brassicas, I think. Maybe some broccoli, definitely some Brussels sprouts sometime this fall uh, from a crop that I planted in the spring, which is rather strange. Now, I did a little bit of insurance. I planted a lot of broccoli for a fall crop a couple weeks ago, but even underneath the current existing broccoli plants, which could very well bolt um, rather soon, I would imagine. If they're gonna bolt, it's probably in the next couple weeks. If they do, I have an insurance policy planted some broccoli seeds the right way in the right conditions right underneath them so even if they were to bolt it's not the end of the world because i have a crop coming in um in its place so you know i think the fall the far the fall garden is going to look incredible it's going to be fantastic super excited for it um yeah, I'm just. I think that's that's mostly it. That's mostly what I wanted to say about the fall garden. We still have some things left, even though I planted the majority of it out already. There's definitely some things that might bolt in this next couple weeks. So if if that does happen, I'll just keep reseeding. Um, things like the arugula for sure has a very high chance of bolting. Things like the beets, they don't germinate very well in these higher temperatures. So I got to stay on top of some of this stuff and make sure that if it's a smaller, you know, um, one of those crops that's just very difficult to grow at this time of the year, got to really pay attention to those. And then we fast forward a couple months from now and we're going to plant things like the, the alliums. So the garlic, the, um, the elephant garlic, we, I definitely want to get some elephant garlic this year without a doubt. Uh, we're going to do some fall onions, as I've discussed on the YouTube channel. Our failed onion crop, I was able to harvest these really small onions, cure them. They're cured, sitting in my house right now, nice and dried up. We can plant those onions um, very easily in the, uh, in the fall. And those onions will then act as sets. They'll get through the wintertime. Uh, once they get through the winter time, then it's very simple at that point. Um, all I have to do is just harvest them in the spring like I would my garlic. They're going to bolt. Um, that's a guarantee. They're going to flower because of that cold process. Because I had harvested them in the summer and then planted them out in the fall, just doing any sort of fall planting of onions is going to basically result in bolted onions the following spring but it doesn't matter because you're going to get a good size to them before they do bolt and that's really what you want that's that's the whole key to this whole thing so we're doing that we're planting the onions out and we're going to do them in a very specific way i may have already mentioned this on fruit talk but it's going to be very exciting to save some space where we're going to have different sets of allium crops in rows which then har are then harvested sometime in June, early June. What will go in between those rows is the heat loving crops that want to be planted out in early June or mid May. So things like the tomatoes, the cucumbers, the you know the the melons, the squash, whatever it is that I want to do, and that will very easily fill that space in right away. I got that idea from Charles Dowding. Quite excited uh, to do that next year because it will save me so much space. I'm even doing a little bit of it today or this year because we have the, the garlic we harvested. And then right after the, har the harvest, I planted a direct seeded my cucumbers. But I'll tell you, the cucumbers could have gotten off to a much earlier start if I had 
started them indoors, transplanted the cucumbers out um, in between the garlic rows, and they would have been way better off rather than direct seeding them just right after the harvest. So there's probably a nice like month of production I probably could have had um, from those cucumbers earlier, maybe at least at least three weeks. Um, not that it's at the end of the world. Uh, I am getting cucumbers as of today, which is a nice little segue into uh, the summer garden. So we're harvesting all kinds of stuff, man. The food is in, is insane. It's just we're so much abundance from the garden now, which is great because a lot of the fruit trees, the fruiting plants are done or have taken a break and haven't necessarily started up just yet, or they're getting ravaged by the catbirds. And I mentioned the catbirds. Ginzi, the, uh, the the scarecrow, really isn't doing a great job this year. I need to get myself a bird bath. I think that's the only option I have. I did get a nice harvest of nectarines and peaches, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't a lot, and the birds are getting the majority of the rest of the peaches. They even went into my apples now. They're going and attacking my apples, which we would at this time of the year. You can get apples in July. I've had them prior my pristine apple was like pretty much perfectly ripe and I was just waiting for it to fall off the tree to harvest it and eat it. We also have the Zestar apples. We have had a couple of them throughout the season so far and they're not bad, um, but they weren't perfectly ripe just yet. So I'm, but I'm worried about them, you know, and overall the fruit just isn't coming until about August. The Mara de Bois strawberries did start up. We've also got some figs coming in, which is nice. Um, the gooseberries are done. We did a big harvest of that. The gumi has been done. Um, you know, there, there's just not that many fruits this year uh, in the orchard. Really don't have any pears. Don't have any, um, the apples, if they continue to get attacked. We didn't have many plums this year. Those got attacked. We're going to have grapes. That's a big saving grace here this year as we bag them. It's been also very dry. And the black rot, even if I didn't bag them, I would have had immense success with the grapes this year not bagging them, which is insane because I never would have expected to have so much dry weather from really May all the way till July as it is today. Um, it's really quite incredible this year how sort of dry it's been for the most part and um, they're largely unaffected I have one cluster of grapes that I did not bag and uh, there was a couple grapes that did get the black rot but the others on that cluster are not necessarily um, affected so um, really interesting how the, the grapes are coming in we may get to try some muscadine grapes at some point the persimmons, all of them are, they fall, every single one of them fell off. Um, I will get to try some pomegranates, you know, but mostly I think my fall is going to be about, <laughs> is really going to be about figs. And that's sort of it, which is really sad um, because I, you know, I work so hard on this and we had that late frost that came in and that probably had a big impact. Plus the birds are really just destroying everything i'll be happy if i get some peaches if i get some apples um we're definitely going to get raspberries and strawberries of an endless amount the blueberries are seemingly impossible to protect i've almost given up on them um and that's most that's honest oh we're going to get some jujubes as well so but that's, that's mostly it. It's really a sad little end, I think, to my fruit season. Unless the fig season really is incredible. We have some, if we get some nice dry weather um, in September, I think I'll be real happy with how the season went. Because um, the summer garden, as I mentioned, is doing really well. So we have all kinds of things, as I mentioned, like the, uh, the cucumber. We have patty pan squash we have melons that are forming the corn is now tasseling and actually getting some size to it we have our first ripe pink brandywine tomato probably tomorrow which is insane 
Um, that's like the best tomato. We have some sun gold tomatoes are coming in. We have uh, plenty of eggplants. I've harvested somewhere around seven eggplants. We made some eggplant fries last night. I also did some stuffed patty pan squash, which is which is like a type of zucchini. And you can cut that stuff open. I wish I had a photo of it. Um, but you cut that stuff open and you can dig out some of the that scallop squash, dig some of that out of there and stuff them, put them in the oven. They're wonderful. Also, we had beans. Where The beans are sort of done for now, but they're starting back up. Um, you can just chop them back and they'll regrow, uh, kind of like a chop and drop style. And um, kind of like a coppice type thing or a pollard. But the the beans, the Kalima beans were very impressive. The uh, dragon tongue bean was very impressive. I have some beans that we dried and we have them in some in jar. Plus we also have some beans that are climbing up the corn, the Hidatsa shield bean, which is actually doing really well in that three sisters planting that we did. We've got basil and and we've got um, we've got chamomile, believe it or not. We have uh, uh, rosemary and we also have ground cherries. And we're gonna really, hopefully the, the ground cherry has impressed me this year because I've grown them in the past and they haven't been all that impressive, but these look very impressive, particularly this variety I'm, in, I'm impressed with. So we'll see how that goes um, with that. So we're, we're basically harvesting a, just a crap ton. And I'll give you a little photo here, a little idea. This was me um, taking July 3rd so this was July 3rd the corn was at my chest actually this wasn't July 3rd uh, this was Ju this was June 30th I think this date here is, is incorrect this was June 30th and the corn was at my chest uh, and they say knee high by July right and then we took another photo here and this guy was taken 10 days later. Yeah, that's right. So July 11th or July 10th, somewhere around there. And the corn now is over my head 10 days later. Um, the potatoes are basically ready to harvest. We're starting to get some squash, some eggplants, some tomatoes at this point. And then now today I took this photo. July 22nd, which is, uh, you know, another 10, 11, 12 days later. And we harvested all the potatoes. The corn is now 10 feet tall. <laughs> the tomatoes are 8 feet tall. We have ripe tomatoes. We've got ripe, all kinds of ripe things in the summer garden. And uh, it's just amazing. It's absolutely amazing how incredible the garden, the summer garden has been excuse me guys, has been doing this year. Um, it absolutely blown away. And I've talked about an update we did 10 days ago. I do. I did another update on the summer garden. Um, I took a video today and you can see that everything looks so massive. And how did we get to this point? Well, this is gonna kind of tie into what I wanted to talk about and how to create a garden, how to really do your own garden. Um, But if you think about this, we need to have the right soil, right? So if we get ourselves um, the right soil from the beginning. Now, I like to use compost, okay? You can use whatever you guys want, but compost really does well in a garden setting. Um, so does worm castings. Maybe you guys can mix some of that in. Maybe a little bit of peat moss, but ideally you want something that's mostly compost based and it's pretty well draining, at least for somebody in a more rainier climate, is that you want something really well draining. And, and the, the reason for that is that all that well draining, those bigger particles, bigger pieces in your soil is gonna give you a lot more air and that air gets to the roots and really is something that they need. So you're not gonna have anaerobic soil conditions 
you're going to have soil conditions that are very conducive that are really conducive to promoting healthy root systems of these plants. That's the most ideal thing that you want here out of these, uh, out of your soil. So, um, that's what we're doing. I think is that we, you know, we, we, we try to basically start the garden off with the right soil. And if you can do that, you just, you don't even need to know anything about the soil, I guess. You just need to pick the right soil at the store. You know, um, you can create it, obviously, but most of you guys who are starting out are going to buy some soil and you want to buy the right stuff. So I would look for something that's organic, an organic compost, maybe a mushroom compost or a green compost from different yard waste and things like that. Um, I wouldn't go with a manure or an animal-based compost. I would go with something that maybe is a little bit more pricey because uh, it's going to get you a little bit more bang for your buck in the long run. So try to find an organic compost. I like to use personally mushroom composts. The Just Natural brand is a big. I'm a big fan of. The Dr. Earth brand's pretty good. Um, there's also the happy frog soil. There's also the coast of Maine. These companies make some pretty good products and you can find an organic compost that they sell. And that's normally what you'd want. I think those companies there I just mentioned, you could probably find them all across the, uh, the country. Find something good from them. Put that stuff down. Before you put it down though, you wanna make sure that you're putting down some cardboard. As I mentioned, in the spring when we created our gardens, when you create a garden, you want to put down that cardboard layer uh, because it just makes things a lot easier, right? As I've, as you can see here, there is some grass poking its head out uh, of different areas, but this whole area, I laid down cardboard in. This was a 10 by seven foot area and I laid down um, even just like uh, painters, paper you can get at the store like that paper you can just roll along the ground you can get it at home depot i got a roll of this stuff you roll it out and it's paper right so paper is going to degrade it's going to turn into compost the worms are going to like it it's going to attract all kinds of biological insects and life in the soil you roll that out eventually it degrades and what it does is it keeps out the weeds it keeps out the grass so you don't have to go in there and start digging up grass and things like that it does depend on where you guys live and what kind of grass you got but if you put down enough layers of cardboard over time um, you know you can get some real thick stuff for a more heavy duty job lay that out for a year maybe even get a tarp you know lay down some tarps and really kill underneath everything underneath the tarp um, if you do that it's very simple. It makes the whole thing just a joke. You can put your soil, your compost right on top of that stuff. Ideally, you want somewhere around three to four inches of new soil. Um, and then every year, you're going to put that soil, more and more soil on top of that. You don't have to go crazy with it every year, but that's going to add the fertility. Uh, I've found that there's definitely some heavier feeders, definitely crops that are heavier feeders like the brassicas, the corn. They just need a heavier soil. My just natural soil conditioner that I like to use um, is just not nutritious enough. Doesn't have enough nutrients in it to provide the the nutrients to this corn, to the brassicas for the most part. So you gotta feed them. I have to give them some supplemental fertilizer. Um, but you know, there's different types of compost out there, guys. There's definitely some that's way more nutritious than others if you can get the roots down into eventually what will happen is that the roots will go down um, through the compost through the cardboard which will degrade and then into the native soil the native soil usually has enough uh, nutrients but I would really focus on the uh, the fertility in the soil the porosity the airflow in the soil how much water the soil holds um, and that's essentially how to create a garden. If you do that, you're basically, you're set because that's the building blocks. Those are the, 
the pieces, right? You want to learn how to get how to play guitar. You got to learn how to strum the guitar. You got to learn all the chords along the the neck of the guitar, right? If you don't know the chords, you don't know how to strum. You're never going to be able to play a guitar. So if you don't have the right soil, you're never going to be able to know how to grow food, grow plants. You just have to have the right building blocks to start. So once we do that, it's really just as simple as starting the seeds indoors, start it, or just direct seeding them into the ground. With the right material as well, the right soil, you can always direct seed right into that. Um, you got to have that right texture, that right composition, and it just becomes a joke. Um, it really is so, so simple. So big recommendation, I think. Um, get out there guys and start a fall garden it's still not too late it's still today is jan it's uh july 22nd so you know get out there by the end of august you still have some time you want to get out there as soon as humanly possible to get this garden in and you'll be like me with your arms up proud happy fed uh swimming in abundance and um I also forgot to mention we got some melons forming. So the melons are going crazy. I, I'm just, I'm overjoyed, okay? I don't see any pests. There's no problems for the most part. There's no cucumber beetle. There's no egg, there's no um, potato beetle. There's nothing in the corn. There's nothing in the tomatoes. The only, the issue I have, the only issue I have with the entire summer garden is I don't have enough calcium in the soil uh, for my tomatoes. They're getting some blossom and rot. But other than that, guys, it's a, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. You can put a potato in the ground, walk away, come back three to four months later, and you got yourself a bunch of potatoes, you know? Put some um, tomato seeds in the ground, trellis them up, prune them a little bit, you got yourself tomatoes, you know? Um, it's, just, it's just crazy. It's so, so simple. You got to have the right soil. You got to feed these things um, if they're heavy feeders. And really the only things I've found so far that are the bigger heavy feeders are the, the brassicas and the, um, and the corn. Um, other than that, get them in the right spot. That's another big tip. Every crop, every vegetable, like our fall garden, would probably want to be in an area right now that's not too warm. But maybe it's a bit warmer later in the season, depending on the angle of the sun, depending on the trees in your yard. You know, you want to determine, as my yard is, I have an area where they get pretty shaded during the day um, in the summertime and in, in the late spring. But in the early spring when there's no leaves on the trees and in the late fall when there's no leaves on the trees, that those areas are getting a lot of sun and they're getting very warm because there's a lot of sun and that's when you need at those different times of the year those more extreme times of the year whereas my summer garden wants sun all day every day you know um so figure that out right get the right microclimate plant the right crops in the right spot the right time timing is everything guys timing is everything with these vegetables if you get the timing right the location right and the soil right, you literally cannot fail. Those are the three big tips to growing annual vegetables. Thank you guys here so much for watching this episode of Fruit Talk. Check out our blog, figboss.com. And also check us out guys on Patreon, patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. If you uh, really like the podcast, consider supporting us there. And uh, leave us a review on iTunes or a review on any of these other podcasting sites that we're on now because it's not just YouTube. Check out our YouTube channel if you're new and you've just found us on the podcast. Uh, we'll see everybody soon, all right? Take care, guys. Stay safe. Well, yeah, yeah, stay safe. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you guys for next week's episode, all right? Take care, guys.